Hello and greetings, friends. We've got a bonus Chapo episode for you. Uh, today, uh, I'm backed up by Noah Cohen, our friend from Blowback, who you might remember from such Chapo episodes, is when he helped uh, help me interview journalist Tom O'Neill about his book Chaos, which explores the many connections between the CIA and the Manson murders. On today's show, we have a uh, similar case that is sure to induce mental illness if you think too hard about it. Uh, we are pleased to be joined by Zachary Treats and Christian Hansen, the creators of a new Netflix documentary series, The Octopus Murders, Zachary Treitz and Christian Hansen. Zachary and Christian, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so I, I, I've seen the first two episodes of this series, and it is terrifying and fascinating. And it, it's like, you. this is a story that goes back to the 1980s, nine, 1990s. But basically, it starts with the, uh, you know, I could say alleged suicide, but it's my show. So I will say the murder of an investigative <laughs> journalist named Danny Casalero. And uh, Christian, I want to start with you. How did you first come to know about Danny Casalero's case and the subject he was investigating at the time of his death? I really just stumbled upon it. I was researching the private prison industry. And one of the major players in that is this company called the Wackenhut Corporation. And um, in the early 80s, Wackenut, which is a su su private, basically a huge private security conglomerate, had uh, formed a joint venture with an obscure, uh, a tiny uh, Native American tribe in the Coachella Valley. And they had plans to manufacture biological weapons and night vision goggles and uh, automatic uh, submachine guns um, for um, simple. Uh, for like the Nicaraguan Contras and, and, and proxy wars like that. And Danny Casalero was, was looking into the Wack and Hud Corporation and its connections to the Cabazon um, Reservation. So that's how I just stumbled upon the, the story of Danny. And he seemed like a really cool and interesting guy. And his um, book that he died writing sounded wild. And it, from what I could tell, nobody really tried to pick up all the pieces where they fell when, when he passed away and uh, it's just been sitting there and I'm, you know, I'm a photojournalist. I'm not a, 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 I guess I am now an investigator, but I was like, well, somebody's got to, somebody's got to tell this, this guy's story. I mean, he died writing it and it, you know, it's just the pieces fell on the floor and, and I reluctantly kind of, but also I was excited and intrigued. I, I picked up the pieces and, and here we are now like 12 years later. And uh, Zachary, how did you, become involved in this project and what can you what can you tell our listeners about who Danny Casalero was but before his untimely end right well when the agency asked me assigned me to be Christian's friend uh, I just knew that he was <laughs> <laughs> heading to the big time and my job was just to steer him in the wrong direction um, yeah. so Christian Christian and I grew up together in Kentucky so we're friends from Louisville we we met in middle school friends in high school and so he's always just been my homie. And um, he he told me about this story. You know, he was a he was working as a photojournalist, uh, usually working for The New York Times. That's how I knew Christian's kind of professional interests, you know. And um, but he started telling me about Danny and all the other stuff he's just mentioned. And it gets, you know, weirder and weirder. This is, you know, 12, 11, 12 years ago. And I, I just thought it was, you know, an interesting story. And then Christian got more and more into it. And I was like a little me and our friends and his sisters, we were all a little worried about Christian at certain points, just getting, you know, first off from his own obsession with it. And then when he started talking about talking to the people that he had told us about, it was, you know, an element of no matter whether these guys are um, reliable or not, they don't seem like they're all great upstanding citizens. Like they might be dangerous perhaps. Um, so there's a worry on that front. And then when, Mike, uh, when Michael Reconosciuto was getting out of prison, who's one of Danny's key sources, one of the people that Christian was talking to, um, he was getting out of prison in 2017 after 26 years in, in, in federal prison. And Christian and I were talking about it. And, you know, we were just like, I mean, my opinion was we had no, you know, no intention of making a documentary. It was just like, if we ever wanted to do anything, or you want to write your book or anything, we are going to regret it for the rest of our lives. If we don't just take a chance on going out there and picking him up from prison. And Michael, you know, luckily for us was interested, was okay with that, you know, 26 years in jail. Suddenly he's in a car with these two 
dudes. Uh, and um, we, we put it on Zach's credit. We flew, to, we flew to Los Angeles, drove around Los Angeles for like a day or two days trying to scrap together the right gear that we needed, audio kit and a camera and lenses. And we we're just driving around LA, putting it all on Zach's credit card. And then, then we took, took our friend Alejandro's broken down car out to California. To remember, didn't the trunk? Didn't there's some issue with the trunk on the way get out? The there? trunk closed, but it, the car broke down on the way to prison. I mean, this this documentary essentially is is one uh, piece of a of a Honda Civic away from not <laughs> existing. <laughs> well, like a real documentary filmmaker, you, you know, you have to you have to devote your resources to the camera and audio, not the car per se. Yeah. But Zachary, like when you, when you started like filming this project, was it like did you think you were going to be making a movie about how your friend turned into Jake Gyllenhaal's character from Zodiac, and not just the movie Zodiac that both of you are now starring in? Yeah. We, <laughs> I mean, Zodiac is a great reference point, by the way, for this. And and I just want to throw one quick Zodiac story in there, really quick. It Please. never makes it into our movie, which is it was a great reference for us when when Robert Downey Jr.'s character is living on the the boat, you know, yeah. Christian. Yeah. yeah, Christian, while we were pitching this story, was living on a boat in the boat basin in New York City. And uh, and wow, like I would awesome. I would I would like, you know, call him. I was writing the, the treatment or whatever, and I would call him and be like, who's this person or whatever. And then I and then we were watching I was watching Zodiac and, and the line is like. He's looking Jake for files or whatever. Like years, Jake Gyllenhaal is looking for years files. Later, years later. Years later. And, and, and Robert Downey Jr. is like, I don't know. I moved on to a boat. Okay? Like why you can't find the documents. <laughs> and I was like, this is Christian right now. Um, He's like, I tossed him. I lost him. And Jake's like, what? You tossed him or you lost him? He's like, I moved on to a boat. What? And, yeah, and I was, yeah, I was living on, a, living on a sailboat at the time. Um, <laughs> all right. Sorry. Well, to answer uh, your I question. Robert Downey Jr. To- uh, says in that scene, if it mattered so much, why didn't you do anything about it? And I, I think like, you know, Christian, I think, I think you very, very much up- upheld his call to do something about it with this, like I said, fascinating and terrifying story. But yeah, to answer, to answer your question really quick is, you know, I knew that we would be in the film in some respect because we were, um, because we just picked him up, picked Michael up. And there was this real symmetry between Danny meeting Michael in when he's at the beginning of his, he's just arrested in 1991 in March of 1991. And then 26 years later, us picking him up, I, you know, we just knew that there was, there was no way to tell it without us in there. I don't love when documentary filmmakers just as a rule kind of make a story about themselves when it's really about somebody else, you know, when it's like, well, this is my journey into it yeah. with this. And, and our producers really actually bear credit or blame for really being like, you guys are a part of the story, whether you want to be or not. So you got to put yourselves in, you know, like we, we need to see it through your frame. And I, I was like, I know, you know, I was just like, it was like a, it was like a intervention or something. I was like, I know, I know We're, we'll, we'll do did, it. Did it give you more control? As a director, though, Zach, I mean, I love essay films in general. That sort of format, you know, the per- the personalization of it. Not necessarily like this is about something else, but it's really about me. But when it's when it is a personal story, I love that that kind of firsthand thing. So yeah, it's 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 nice to be able to when it whenever you have more control over what the thing is, and and with a documentary, that's really tough when you're trying to capture things like you have no idea what somebody's going to say. When you can say it, or when I can talk to you and I, I, I know you, yeah, it was. It's just another layer that I think was really fun to be able to play with, and, and whatever it gives a proxy to the audience of a mo- of what it feels like to go into this. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Well, yeah, I, I well, just watching the first two episodes, I feel like I was uh, <laughs> definitely getting into it. And before I thought I'd sort of turn things over to Noah, who has researched this case a lot and sort of comes to it with his own interests and perspective i guess i just want to begin like with the actual story here which like your story begins with the alleged suicide of journalist danny casalero in a motel in west virginia in 1991 but i want to talk about where the story began for him which like most sort of uh sprawling narratives begins with something that, that seems very simple and dry and kind of boring but in this narrative sprawls into like a leviathan level of murder, corruption, and crime. And the story it's, that it, it starts out with, with a contract dispute. <laughs> yeah, a contract dispute over like very early uh, computer software in the early days of like computer programming. A company called Inslaw was contracted by the Justice Department to write software that would allow law enforcement agencies essentially to compare 
uh, just data across like you know uh, voluminous files of, of of legal cases to see connections and reference these re- reference past legal cases very. It, easily. I mean, it was it was like a really early and sort of uh, first stab at creating digital databases of government information that could be regularly accessed by government officials across the country at all levels. It just so happened that the data in this case was essentially uh, arrest records and other criminal information, uh, meaning like criminal records that could be shared between among prosecutors. Uh, but it's like, it's helpful to think of promise as like a gigantic indexing tool that was just kind of one of the first ever ones that was bidding for government contracting at that scale with like a digital computerized product. So Christian, could you tell us what happened to the company Inslaw when they created this like quite revolutionary and effective form of software? What happened with them in the Justice Department who contracted them well, to fulfill they, this? They were given like an initial pilot project of, I think, to install the software into um, 20, a, 20 a subset of U.S. attorney's offices. And around the country, and uh, and if that pilot project went well, they would expand the the software to be the standard U- U.S. DOJ um, case management software. And pretty early on in the implementation and installation of the contract, the negotiate the, everything goes tits up. I mean the. DOJ stops paying. They say that there's uh, problems with this, this, and this, and they're not fulfilling their end of the bargain. And it's it's all very confusing. And then the um, the former U.S. Uh, the former U.S. Attorney General Elliot Richardson, who's this like lion figure, this famous figure in Washington D.C., goes to the he's representing Inslaw. And he goes to the Justice Department. He's like, well, I've got he's major clout. I can I'll I'll settle this for you guys. I'll just go in and talk to him and we'll clear this up and you, you'll get your money. They're owed about $6.8 million or, eight, you know, under $10 million, but a significant sum of money in the, in the early eighties. And, uh, you know, basically the, uh, Elliot Richardson can't do anything about it. And the company goes, uh, goes bankrupt. And just some reference here. Elliot Richardson is a guy who became famous because he was the attorney general that resigned rather than fire the prosecutors investigating Watergate. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. So yeah, he's, he's a guy with a lot of clout who sort of put his integrity on the line for this company that was apparently getting like just having their work stolen by the justice department. Yeah. And Danny was a, he was a journalist for a trade public, a computer trade publication. And actually, like uh, listeners uh, may not know this, but uh, Silicon Valley was actually only one of two major computer software uh, and programming hubs in the country in the 80s and 90s. The other really big one for especially the purposes of this episode of Chapo uh, was Northern Virginia. And therein, you know, Danny Casalero comes across this case. He hears about it and he gets in touch with Bill Hamilton directly. And that kind of sets Casalero on the journey. Bill Hamilton, who is the head of Inslaw, the, the company. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Bill Hamilton, yes, yeah. the head of Inslaw. And uh, where does Danny go from Inslaw? So it's also it's it's interesting. Like Danny's sort of at a, in a it's sort of a perfect storm because he's there are very few journalists that have a deep background in computer software. But then also Danny had investigated the Watergate case in the early seventies. His next door or his uh, one of his neighbors in McLean, Virginia, as a child was James Jesus Angleton. I mean he so he's sort of like interested in the spy and conspiracy world. But then he's also got a, a technical background in. In, in computer. So he's kind of the guy. He's obscure, but he's ready to go. Like he's ready to write the book on the Inslaw case. And he has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. I just want to add this in because he thinks of himself as this poet and novelist, like a Hemingway like character, who of course was a journalist, you know, to support himself when he was writing books. So he he's like looking for the big story, something big. And it's like he just happens to have a background in computers and really no this obscure world better than most people possibly could. Um, so D- Danny met with um, the founder of Inslaw in ni- in August of 1990. A few months prior to that, this founder, Bill Hamilton, got a call from a guy named Michael Riconosciuto, the same one we men- Zach and I mentioned as having picked up from prison. And he tells, he had told 
Bill Hamilton, that basically a federal uh, bankruptcy judge had ruled that the Justice Department stole the Insaw software using trickery, fraud, and deceit. And then that ruling was then upheld in an appeals court. And at this point in the story in August 1990, there's a third court uh, hearing that's like gearing up and in the works. So, yeah, like it, it's 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 appealed. The judge that ruled in favor of Inslaw is essentially kicked off the bench and replaced yeah. with the guy prosecuting or like defending on behalf of the government. So it's just the judge is just a federal judge is basically fired and replaced by the guy who basically helped the Department of Justice steal this promise software. Yeah. So, and, yeah, and so like, there's, there's a lot of weird stuff going on. It, it, that's all very clear. That's all very on the surface. The ruling is very clear. Trickery, fraud, and deceit couldn't be in more clear terms. But the question of why yes. is not clear <laughs> at all. And why so, the Justice Department won't just settle with this company, pay him a few million dollars. It's a tiny contract for the government. Well, and it's like the lifeline of this company. Just pay him, move on, and like we'll just keep on going. So, So Bill is just beating down the door of anything you can find to, to answer that question of why. And Danny is kind of stepping in in 1990 to try to answer that question. And then you brought up Mike Reconosciuto, who's also this like pretty wild and enigmatic character. He is a child prodigy His, uh, but he, and he, I don't know if you said in the documentary, but I remember he claimed to have gone, he went to Stanford. Yeah. Um, but he was 16. Yes. And he was like, the, he, you know, worked in a lab with the Nobel laureate. He, who remembered him as having, you know, like specifically as being like a bright guy. Um, the kind of guy who shows up to the first day of college at 16 with his homemade, with a homemade argon laser. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Thank and you he, well. and he's also then gets into drug dealing and other criminal rackets. And uh, he has a distinctive look and his nickname in the press at different points is Fat Mike or as a moniker. At least that's what I was. That's what I was. Uh, when somebody told me about who he was, they were like, well, you got to know about Fat Mike. Uh, and I thought they meant the no effects guy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the the thing that to me was like super interesting about Reconosciuto is that he he's only like the first in a series of people who exist in this kind of world. And in the story you tell who all sound kind of similar in that, like they have vague dealings with the government. They're also criminals. They also tell a lot of lies. You can't totally trust them, but a lot of the times there is some truth in what they say. And that truth can be very scary. Uh, so what is, you know, what is it that Reconosciuto says to Hamilton that then gets to Casalero? That sort of, I think is like, you know, part of the ignition fuel that sets at least Casalero go. My recollection of that conversation, uh, Bill documented the, this two hour long call he had with, with Michael. And, you know, the first thing he says is, have you ever heard of the Wackenhut corporation? And he's like, talks about the Wackenhut corporation. Who is, who's on its board of directors. It's this who's who of, of the intelligence world department heads. Uh, Bill department Casey head. and Frank Carlucci are two people on the Wackenhut board. Uh, yeah. Listeners yeah, of the Bill show Casey, will remember them. Bill Casey was outside council, uh, right. Um, yeah. So, they, and then he's like, there was an, and there's a, this Indian reservation in the, in the Coachella Valley called the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians. And in the early 80s, the Wackenhut Corporation formed a joint venture with this Native American reservation. And I was the head of research for this joint venture. And among other th projects we were working on, which included biological uh, weapons and uh, machine guns and night vision goggles, um, we, took your software source the source code for your software and we i put a back door into the software and which then we sold to other countries through um like third party uh cutouts and um now the u.s government has been uh monitoring the whatever the other the people who bought the software are using the software to to there's a back door into the into the databases now. And this was also, I think, like it's worth uh, like it's twofold here because this is also Hamilton learns like the company Inslaw hadn't known that other foreign governments were using their product, their software until they got a letter in the mail from the Canadian government. That and, was really funny because they they, yeah. they they had no idea that their that their their software was in the hands of foreign governments until Canada contacted them to ask them, "Hey, can you do a can how, how do we change this into French? Because it has to be you know uh, bilingual for Canada." Yeah. Well, and yeah. this also though, however, this is answers the why because right. the why as to why something like Inslaw would matter so much is that Inslaw is not just about you know 
um, making sure that, you know, small contracts go to favored friends, because maybe it's a bit about that, but it's also, and perhaps really mostly about the fact that Inslaw was a backdoor that the government, American government could sell to other governments and then spy on them and could monitor the people in their systems and the people that they were processing. And I very, think that that's a, it's a very, um, it's a great you know, idea. It's, it's, and I mean, it's, it's, we, it still happens all the time. The NSA has many, I mean, I've reported on this, but like the NSA has, uh, an entire, uh, division called the commercial solutions center that is devoted ostensibly, like publicly, they say that their mission is to like work with companies to make their stuff secure. When the reality is that of course, like there's an offensive component and what they're really also trying to do is find ways into, and you, you know, uh, and to you know, find ways into uh, foreign systems. And this also to the Castle era, the one, uh, just to ask a question on this point, yeah. you brought up the Cabazon band of mission Indian reservation. Mm-hmm. So, a listener may be wondering, like, hold on a minute. Like, why does an Indian reservation in the Coachella Valley uh, have anything? Like, why would a, why did, why are they shacked up with this like renegade computer hacker guy and uh, Inslaw software being stolen and Wackenhut? What is their interest in an Indian reservation? I mean, so there's um, in the early '80s or late '70s, a man named John Philip Nichols had wound up on the reservation Zach actually or okay this guy named John Philip Nichols had this belief that the Native American reservations are sovereign nations not just sort of uh you know contiguous to the United States not part of the United States their own you know islands of sovereignty inside the United States and so that therefore you can do things on these reservations that you can't do you know in California which is like surrounds the Cabazon reservation on all sides. And, um, and so he actually, you know, implementing this belief in sovereignty, he started selling um, tax-free cigarettes through mail order um, and tax-free alcohol. And then he eventually built the first um, native American poker casino on this reservation. And um, from there, you know, it's like, okay, we got the poker going, Let's get some government contracts in here, and and he so he brings the Wackenhut Corporation in to start getting like uh, ostensibly like minority favored grants because they formed a joint venture with the Native American Reservation. They get preferential treatment um, f- for certain grants, and um, and then also like they wanted to start um, doing uh, manufacturing that would be otherwise illegal in the state of California. And the other thing I want to bring up with Cabazon uh, is that in the Indian Reservation is that the Cabazon Band of Mission Indian Tribe, which is 20-something people uh, strong, uh, was also the tribe that uh, whose case to demarcate whose taxes and where the income from casinos, where they would be taxed, went all the way to the Supreme Court. It is, you know, the it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's an important law, and the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians is not just part of, uh, you know, American conspiracy theory, history, and, and lore. It's also a very important part of the actual history, uh, you know, above board history of America. And yeah. in telling the story of how it was that Indian casinos were able to, with much less risk, uh, grow and develop over the course of the 80s and 90s, because no longer did they have to, you know, like, there was like, the states like, uh, definitively were not getting that income. And what's more, there's another important part of this, which is, you know, if you're in the 1970s and you want to open up a poker a poker room, who do you hire and who do you work with to do that? And so there's a lot of newspaper reporting from the time of the 70s at the time that Philip John Philip Nichols shows up and in, in, in begins working with the Indian Reservation that a bunch of well-known mob outfit associates are on the premises developing this gambling business. Yeah. So it's it's truly like and it's you know this area is like probably like the area of this reservation is probably like maybe like the parking lot at Giant Stadium, like not even. <laughs> so this line. is like this guy created, I mean, and he was a pretty canny, you know, like like fig- and, and shrewd and, and ultimately vi- and pretty violent figure. But he figured out that like, you know, with this like sovereign citizen strategy, you know, kind of like uh, Clive and Bundy dressed up, uh, you know, in, in a, with a like a legalistic Native American uh like uh, facade was able to, you know, end up creating like this, uh, 
really uh, like a nest of criminal activity throughout the 80s. And that leads to the second set of murder or rather the second murders. Um, The reason that there gets to be a plural for sure in octopus murders, at least as I first learned about them, uh, which is a triple murder that takes place there in the 1980s uh, prior to the Inns Law uh, affair, but yeah. also points to, you know, yet another like a uh, crazy set of violence that, uh, you know, gets gets dealt out in association with the actors of this of this conspiracy, so to speak. Could I, could I just kind of back us through because it gets so complicated, but I just think it's a helpful lens to look at this through who a little bit of who John Philip Nichols is and yeah. get to that that triple homicide is like looking at it backwards from now. The Cabazon versus the state of California verdict in the Supreme Court, which took place in the middle, mid to late 80s, is, like you said, an extremely important uh, what became a law, the Indian Gaming Law, um, Indian Gaming Act. And it's 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 ostensibly and, and I think from talking to Native Americans, a really good thing, right, <laughs> because it's the first time in the tortured history of U.S. versus Native American relations where you don't just have money that's just doled out to these tribes, it's a way that the tribes can actually fund themselves and employ themselves. Um, And it's brought a huge boon. And maybe people think, oh, like gambling, it's shady. It's weird. I don't, I have very few opinions on that, but in terms of employment and self-determination, it's really powerful and, and objectively seemingly, I would say good thing, right? It just so happens that our story, and we don't, we don't even have time to really get into it in the documentary. So it's nice to bring it up here. It happens to kind of stem from this guy, Dr. John Philip Nichols, who has a very odd background showing up at this tribe saying, I can help you guys. And his background that we touch on seems to be in the nexus point between union teamsters background. uh, I mean, work in in Milwaukee and Washington, DC, the mafia, because of its associations with Jimmy Hoffa and his associations in the mafia and, and John Nichols own associations with the mafia and and the intelligent and the intelligence world. And John Nichols had a, (laughs) is showing up to this tribe saying, I'm like a government grant helper dude, but he's not necessarily mentioning the work that he's done in Chile and Brazil, where he was (laughs) in the forefront of, of right before all these anti-communist coups, you got John Nichols down there in Chile hanging out as an evangelical leader, organizing voting blocks of people, peasants mostly, to vote against Allende and keep it as a um, pro-U.S. government. So he's an, he's a he's he's one of the most fascinating people I've ever researched or, or heard about. But he's uh, and he's got this weird legacy as this Indian gaming law that nobody really talks about as his his association with it. But the stew of the world he comes from, intelligence, mob, unions, all that stuff, just brings to bear on this tiny tribe in Southern California. Yeah, and think about Doc Phillips. If you'll indulge me, another film reference here. He really reminded me a lot of Robert De Niro's character in Killers of the Flower Moon as this like very shady guy with a lot of. I would say suspiciously close relationships with the indigenous communities, as you said, Zachary, in countries that that just happened to have right wing dictatorships imposed on them right after he left town. But like, yeah, like, how, like, how, how do you think like he he leveraged this? Because like, you interview his son in the movie. He describes him in a positive light as an agent of social change. Uh, Like, how did he like leverage his relationships with these communities essentially to create a private? interzone of like deep state intelligence organized crime weapons manufacturing and uh, crime (laughs) it's so complicated i mean i just love this story so much because it's so fascinating and i love bobby's view of of his dad because it's so complicated thinking about his father He, he he loves his dad and his dad um you know was was a was a powerful part of his life obviously and 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 he looks at his dad as somebody who ultimately weirdly whether he even wanted to or not created the wealth of, of ultimately did what he, what he set out to do right now, the Cabazons have a shiny casino. They make a lot of money doing that. And, and, and it's, it's a good so, thing. So many them. tribes, so many so, tribes and, and tribes around the country. And, and it's almost like an accident of history. If you look at it through our viewpoint 
that that even happened because John Nichols seems to have really been mostly interested in um, these quasi intelligence projects. And also, I think that that's, I think I agree totally. And I think that it's also points to one of the things about uh, this case that to me is so like, you know, what makes it so uh, uh, it can fill a full four part series, for example, is that like, you know, and, and there's a lot that we won't touch on in this interview, but as viewers will see that there are other kinds of, you know, dimensions or figures who come up who have other connections to seemingly important parts of, you know, uh, like, a, you know, uh, major social developments, let's say. And to me, it's not evidence again uh, of like, you know, some like a grand far reaching centralized anything, but just a way of showing how if you do look at these kinds of stories quite often, I think that it shows that you can find how power structures all over the country and, and abroad work. And it shows how uh, similar they all are in many respects. Uh, I mean, along 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 those lines, like another another major thread in American history that the tentacles of the octopus get into, and the promise system is connected to, is the Iran Contra scandal. Because you talk about a man named Ed Bryan, his relationship to the Reagan administration, and how the promise system is in, in like in your telling of the story, essentially a payoff to him for arranging the release of the Iranian hostages right after Reagan's election. Yeah, it's uh, just so you know, it's it's Earl Bryan. Earl Bryan, so sorry. Um, so Earl, Earl Bryan was a guy who knew. Oh my gosh, there's actually so much on Earl Bryan that we don't even get into in this. He was a neurosurgeon in California, one of the youngest people, I think the youngest people at the time, to be head of California's Health and Human Services, whatever that's called now. Um, um, very under, likely part of the Phoenix um, v- Operation Phoenix in Vietnam. Uh, allegedly, was uh, he was a neurosurgeon who was went over to Vietnam as a, as a young man came back extremely decorated. Um, wow, a, a suddenly, neurosurgeon who went to Vietnam and did, worked in the Phoenix program? I mean, the mind only begins to conjure up what the what that entailed. But, to, you know, the Phoenix stuff is all pretty under wraps. That's, that's been the, an allegation that's thrown around a lot. And then suddenly he's in Reagan's cabinet as a, when Reagan is governor of California. And um, he, he, after he left government, he started a bunch of different companies and one of them is this company that tried to buy Inslaw and buy buy the Promise software from Inslaw in the eighties. And Bill refused to sell it. Bill refused and to sell it. A representative of the company said, "Well, we have ways of making you sell." And Bill's like looking at the receiver, like, "What? The, what's this guy? You know, what, this is idiot. Yeah, what's I'm a software company. I'm not running. I'm not running numbers in Chicago. Like. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but Earl Bryan is close friends with Ed Meese, who was who was. Um, you know, in the Reagan campaign and then became eventually Reagan's attorney general. And um, he's just kind of like a kitchen cabinet member. This is you know, how you say it of, of Reagan's entourage or O'Brien is. And he owns, we don't even get into this at the time. He owned financial news network, which was eventually sold and became C- CNBC. He owns um, the competitor to the AP, a major player in the, in the news industry at the time, which was um, UPI. United Press International. Um, he's, if you, I don't know if you're listening, he's very much like a, um, almost a Robert Maxwell ish character mm, in some, yes. some respects. Our list, yes, that, that, that name will strike a chord with our there's listeners. A, there's, a, there's a bit of the Maxwell in, in Earl Bryan. And interestingly, um, Maxwell, the allegation is that Earl Bryan was selling Promise Software for the US government, the pirated version with the backdoor in it, and the, that his, um, uh, a doppelganger in the UK, Robert Maxwell, who was a agent for Israeli intelligence, was selling the Promise software for Israeli interests. So it's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a, all kinds of symmetry there. And so anyway, the the thing is that Michael kind of puts into context, and I just want to say it's it's Michael's view. It's not our view, and it's not uh, you know it's, it's not our view. Is that um, not necessarily? is that Earl Bryan went to, during the campaign for Reagan to become president when he, w- when he was trying to take Jimmy Carter's you know, job in 1980, that Earl Bryan was, went over to Iran, Iran as a, because he spoke Farsi and had connections and had business there. Connection. He already was a vendor to the Iranian government. So he had already had connections there. 
and that he and and Michael puts himself into this story that he and Michael went to Cal- went to Iran and were involved with a forty million dollar transaction where the hostages that had been taken in Iran and after the revolution in nineteen seventy nine Amer- fifty two American hostages would be kept in Iran until after the election so that Jimmy Carter you know would be this weak weak on Iran president who couldn't get them out. And then Ronald Reagan comes in, saves the day, gets the hostages out, and he looks like a hero. And 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 if you want to look at history through that lens, a lot of it makes sense in that the hostages were released the day you know, within a few minutes of Reagan's inauguration. Um, it's also worth kind of adding that there's now evidence, including a front page story in the New York Times from this past year that sort of illustrates that the the Reagan October surprise wasn't like one plot so much as it was, you know, where as we're seeing the contours of it in time, a deliberate effort, like, you know, an all hands on deck kind of thing with anybody who could have a plausible way of reaching the Iranians to get them to do exactly what they ended up doing. And the New York Times reporter, Peter Baker, their White House reporter, published a story about a former a a Texas politician named Ben Barnes, who was like fantastically corrupt uh, in his day uh, working in politics there, uh, who copped to being uh, part of this plan, who copped to being part of the plot. Just to to, it's also the the campaign manager for Ronald Reagan was William Casey, who is a legend of the OSS, the that which preceded the CIA and then after the election became the CIA, the director of the CIA during the entire Reagan administration until he died very conveniently right before testifying in Iran Contra. That is important. <laughs> the fucking October surprise happened. I'm sorry. I don't give a fuck. I don't care what you say. It fucking I mean, I, I think it's, I don't I'm, know if I'm Michael was you, there, man. but it definitely <laughs> happened. The 1980 election was rigged. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, the Republicans. but Michael the puts Republicans. himself into this position. And I think that's the thing that we don't necessarily vouch for, which is that Michael has a tendency to, to kind of throw himself into the middle of these giant milieus where you're just like, damn, dude, you're in the desert. And you're also in the in you're in the California desert. You're in Iran. You're in Washington state. Like you're in an unbelievable amount of places with an unbelievable group of people. And the problem for us eventually was that not necessarily in our October surprise, but other stories where he seemed to be in very strange people with very strange places with very powerful people. He just was, <laughs> and it's like we document it. And so it becomes hard to figure out what's real and what's not. And when you're watching a movie, like Michael Riccanosciuto is not the kind of guy who looks like he would be in a room with Bill Casey or Frank Carlucci or like in that world. He's a very weird uh, sort of <laughs> nerdy. He's kind like of a his, weird looking dude. Yeah, too, yeah I, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, he's, he's sort of a shabby looking individual who also happens to be a genius on a number of levels. There's, who there's was a story about, about or Michael. <laughs> <laughs> there's a story that we don't even get into, which is that John Nichols went to the Picatinny Arsenal, which is the uh, l- uh, large artillery testing or development lab in New Jersey. Um, uh, for the army and they go there and, and Michael walks in he is very shabby. Like you said, I think, I think somebody said that he was just in deep need of a shower and he's just chopping it up with these physicists about how, you know, ways to do things like the rail gun, which is an experimental weapon at the time and still is sort of an experimental weapon with the idea of taking simple electric energy to create a projectile that that is uh you know damaging um it's it's michael was looking at it as a way to shoot satellites out of the sky with a projectile um and and there he is in picatinny arsenal with john philip nichols just doing blackboard exercises you know physics exercises he's 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 not not there he's we called the physicist from darpa and asked him about it and he confirmed the story (laughs) <laughs> yeah jeez and, and this is a guy this is a guy who's like the last episode that i saw is is the footage of him getting out of federal of, out of out of california prison uh after doing a 26 year stretch for manufacturing methamphetamine which is also a bit odd as well that you, you interview a law enforcement officer who says i've arrested who knows how many people for manufacturing meth and then none of them got 26 year sentences in prison 
Yeah, John Powers working as a detective in Riverside County saw a few uh, few meth cases. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think the federal the federal system is definitely different than Michael's, and maybe there's I think that there was aggravated stuff on top of that. Just 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 to sort of get, I like to give the benefit of doubt as much as possible to every single person in this story, and then even when you're being nice, <laughs> see what's remaining. And what's remaining is like Michael. Um, did did himself i think zero favors in his prison sentence and stuff like that but and and he was claiming that it was retribution for him coming forward about the insla story the october surprise what happened in the desert in california all this stuff and and you know it's you look at what happened and the people he was dealing with and you can definitely see a world in which these people would not want him out in the world talking that's just there's every reason for him not to be talking there's a couple people that I don't think we'll have time to get to in the, in the course of this conversation, but there is one more person um, who I think you focus on in the story uh, that I think rightfully so. And he's really, really interesting. And he's another guy with the last name Nichols, but unrelated to the Southern Nichols. And this guy uh, is Robert Booth Nichols, or we can just call him Booth. And Booth is somebody who you guys find may be more, you know, if people are looking at those who may have been connected to the circumstances of Danny's death in West Virginia, uh, Booth may be someplace uh, to start looking uh, more than others. Um, So I was a bit curious about how he comes into the picture for you guys researching this and what made him uh, the uniquely menacing figure that he was. I I think Christian should answer this, but I just want to say, Robert Nichols for me as a filmmaker comes in as Michael's nemesis. They had worked together in Cabazon and they had. Oh, so like off. Michael's Dwight and Dwight Schrute and, and <laughs> Booth Nichols is Michael Scott. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of classic pairing and they're both talking to Danny and they both hate each other. Um, <laughs> and they're talking about what they had done in their respective and they're, they're bouncing off of uh, their information off of Danny and he's like kind of a go between. And so, but Christian, yeah, who who is Robert Booth Nichols? Assistant uh, to the International Man of Mystery. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Robert, yeah, Robert Booth Nichols enters the story at Cabazon as well. There was a um in the effort to sell um weapons to the Nicaraguan Contras, there was a weapons demonstration of a of a um some night vision goggles and some uh, machine guns. And Robert Booth Nichols had a patent for a a small, cheap to manufacture um, uh, submachine gun that looks very similar to the Mac 10 and uh, called the G77, I think. It doesn't matter. It's not, you can't go to the store and buy one, I don't think. <laughs> and so that's how he enters into the story. And then, sort of like when Ka- Cabazon, Fred Al, one of the tribal members is murdered uh, in, a, in, a, in a hit hired uh, by all accounts by. Um, John Philip Nichols, who had a habit of hiring hits on people throughout the 80s and into the 90s. And um, so everything kind of falls apart at Cabazon. And Robert Booth Nichols and Michael then start their own company called Meridian International Logistics. And they're trying to get their own government contracts. And, the, and the, But then something happens and Michael and, and Robert have this huge falling out. And by the time... Um, and, and But Michael had told Danny about this guy Robert and so Danny tracks down um Robert Booth Nichols and they start having uh long 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 telephone conversations which we have you know we have a lot of Danny's phone bills and you can see that Danny will call Robert at at you know midnight in in Virginia which is whatever 9 p.m. in in LA and they'll talk until it'll it's like 3 in the morning 3:30 in the morning for Danny and then you can see that Danny's back up at six or seven a.m., like talking to Bill Hamilton. He's like, you know, he's not sleeping. He's he's just like running the phone and running this investigation. And yeah, for some reason, and it's really hard, it's really unclear. But if you now Robert Booth Nichols is sort of a famous figure on the internet and in conspiracy lore. But in 1991, he was a totally vague guy that he just it was a name that you know he got from Michael. And well, why, why though, is he a figure? Cause like, I think you're selling only slightly short. Like this guy is like a fucking, like he's more than the other people you put on screen. He's like, you know, he, he is, uh, he's at once kind of scary, 
but he's also like kind of got like a the sweaty desperation that like a lot of criminals sort of exude um when a microscope or a magnifying glass comes anywhere near them like uh you know like what is it what was it like i'm, I'm curious for you to, yeah, your take on I his mean, like personality <laughs> his uniqueness he's a, he's a money launderer he's got uh close connections to the gambino crime family he's uh got connections to the intelligence community. Um, you know, he he's from a very wealthy family in Los Angeles. His dad was a renowned uh, doctor. They lived in the Hollywood Hills. I think, didn't each of the kids have their own, uh, like, cars? Like, like nice Porsches. cars. Yeah, Porsches when they were, like, when 16. They were 16. He was just a, he, drive around. The dad, the parents were always traveling. The kids just, like, had control of this house in the Hollywood Hills. And then... the. Robert Booth Nichols dodges the draft. This none of this even made it into the movie, but Robert Booth Nichols dodges the draft uh, supposedly and ends up in Hawaii and gets picked up for. I mean, why would you go? The, you're not even crossing. You're still in the United <laughs> States. And uh, and so, so as the story goes, that's when he got recruited by the intelligence community. But he he does start working with an organized crime, alleged organized crime figure in Hawaii named Harold Akimoto, who you know be, kind of becomes his mentor and. You know, when Robert Booth Nichols was married a few years into his relationship with Akimoto, Akimoto was like served as his father. His father wasn't invited, but Akimoto was like his dad. And so then, you know, he goes to Switzerland and and, and learns banking. And he it, it, throughout the 70s, it, 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 it's hard to say exactly what he did, does. He always he has multiple properties all over the world. He always flies first class. He always stays at world class hotels, but he doesn't have a job. What does he do? I don't know. I don't know what he does. He doesn't do anything, but he's got a lot of money. I mean, I don't think he is disowned by his family. I don't think his 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 dad was rich. He had a Porsche when he was 16 or whatever. But I, I don't think that. Uh, Can we just tell one story that was like a, a just a moment in time for me while we were making this, which is that Christian, we found a name of somebody who knew Robert Wood Nichols and we called this guy up. We won't say any names, but, you know, not many people know Michael. I mean, Robert Nichols anymore. Uh, that are still alive. And this guy, Christian calls up and he's like, Oh, Bob. Yeah. He was, he was one of the baddest, baddest guys in the NSA. He used to, <laughs> he used to go and be sent off as like, cause he looked kind of like a Clark Gable kind of guy. He used to be sent. You think that you think that when people are, um, you know, you, you have spies sent in to seduce prime ministers. Well, what happens when you send Bob over there to seduce the secretary? <laughs> and, and that he was he was somehow this intelligence operative who was um you know not only handling sort of like financial crimes and stuff like that um but that that he was that he was the super spy guy and then and then he had also spent some time in vietnam and, and what's weird is like it all kind of checks out because he had this tourism business where he was taking people over to vietnam um anyway but but the point is like this guy's like oh you're you're dealing with Bob you're dealing with some dangerous folks okay here's what you need to do he's like I he's like you know Michael and we're like yeah we know Michael he's like Michael's a good guy Bob not so much here's what you need to do um, I'm gonna send you I'm gonna send you a plutonium tip bullets okay and I'm gonna teach you how to make your own gun because you're gonna need something special to deal with all these people who are gonna come through your door so I need you to get a 10 millimeter not a nine millimeter a 10 millimeter barrel. And I'm going to send you the components through the mail because, you know, when these guys come through the door, they're, they're not that smart. OK, you can take them on. You know, and Christian's like, whoa, 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 what are we talking about? He's like, he's like, they're going to come after you and you need to be prepared. <laughs> it's like, dude, we just wanted to talk about Bob's life 40 years ago or 30 years ago. Now you're talking about plutonium tipped bullets. Plutonium tipped bullets? Who is yeah. He, what is he, the Terminator? Jesus. <laughs> it was just, well, I mean, this actually, this is a really good segue to what I, wa I wanted to get to next, which was, you know, that like. Your documentary is about like it begins with the death of Danny Casalero, but you there's a, a neat trick that you guys do as a or rather like it's a, as a device. Um, you weave not only like the story of yourselves making this and just how complicated and tough it is, but also you sort of pose the question, you know, like Christian, you know, did he get a little bit lost in the sauce on this? Did he, you know, did he get a little bit too far in the weeds on this? And you know the thing is, is that rather than portray it actually as like a stereotypical rabbit hole narrative, like you guys made a, a four part Netflix series out of it. And like, I think tell a pretty cogent story and, you know, end on a note of saying like, you, you can live your lives too. Like it's, you don't have to like be oppressed by the knowledge that bad people do things in dark fields at night. 
like I, I was kind of curious, you know, how you like made that, like, w- like how you got from that place of thinking like, this is a crazy obsession I have. I'm going to make a book out of this to We are going to make a movie. Well, that's a good question for Zach, but I, I you know, I was reminded of that. There was a New York times, I think podcast about uh, ultimately about the um, YouTube algorithm. And this guy just is like watching YouTube and the, and he just never presses off. And the the videos that are playing just get more and more dark, and he just gets total. His brain gets totally scrambled by like QAnon conspiracy crap, and he goes like totally nuts just like from watching YouTube videos. And like the sort of then he sees the light, uh, maybe reads, gets a New York Times subscription or something, and realizes that like uh, this, <laughs> they see it, and, and it's like this. Like it really is very literally like a uh, cautionary tale about conspiracy theories but this is sort of different because i'm like this this guy who in the footage is clearly going a little nuts but and my friend comes along to document it but then we like solve murders and like document this like conspiracy that's driving me crazy that like actually is it'll many it largely real and you know we come out okay on the other side uh, yeah, I, I guess like I, I, I want to close out. The last question I want to ask you guys is like along those lines of perhaps not keeping your sanity. And um, I guess my my question is, how do you do a project like this? And like we, we've touched on like maybe one one hundredth of the scope of <laughs> what this investigation actually touches on. But like, how do you how do you take in all this knowledge or try to sort of metabolize it in a way and not see the tentacles of this octopus like everywhere you look nowadays. Cause I mean like there are a lot of parallels in this story to other high profile conspiracy tinged events. Like for instance, the Jeffrey Epstein case who suicided himself on the same day, August 10th that Danny Casalero did also happens to be my birthday. So oh, uh, wow. easy to remember, but like, I like, I mean, when you, when you see, when you see current events or like news stories, like how do you, do you, do you do you do you see it through the lens of this octopus narrative, or do you, do you see do you see the tentacles everywhere, or or do you see them more as like discrete events? That's a really good question. For for me, I I, I what I haven't done yet. I, I'm illiterate in the uh, modern machinations. I, I of what I documented that was happening in the 80s and early 90s. I haven't gone for into you know 95, 96, 97, 98 to like trace to track it my assumption is that if people didn't really get caught and it was extremely lucrative which it appears to be uh what it's it's still going on but it's evolved and gotten more advanced and i don't know um but yeah we think of we do talk about mk ultra a lot uh amongst ourselves and and apply it to like you know patty hurst for instance we're looking at things that happened in the past um and we you know that's just rife with like you know, who, who, what major players in history were actually had their brains scrambled by Jolly West? You know, who, who knows? It's <laughs> who a good among us is ask. not an MK Ultra <laughs> test subject? Yeah. <laughs> if you look around the room and you can't tell who the test subject is, not me for sure. That's for sure. Just want to be really clear. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Zach? Do you have a, a, a take? You're, you're more measured and, and practical than I am. I, think. <laughs> I mean, I think that what, what you said is right is that, is that we do it by keeping a strong, a tight focus on the time period, even though it's broad. Uh, that we're researching and I try not to generalize, you know, and just say like, well, it's all connected. It's, you know, Epstein is connected there. Okay. If it's connected, like show me how it's connected. And, and actually, well, August 10th, you talk about, you. yeah, yeah. If you talk about Epstein, we could numerology. Actually yeah. Oh, we, <laughs> yeah. Could, we could, we could do it. And, and another um, way to drive yourself insane. You know, there's really just enough here for us to sit in our little eighties, nineties, seventies sandbox for the next 20 years, you know, and, 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 and get deeper and deeper into the stuff that we didn't even have time to do in the, in the show. So it's not really a worry about, uh, about seeing it everywhere in the modern world, as long as you're sticking with the past, you know, I guess. I will, I'll say, of- I'll give one, uh, I'll give my own unsolicited quickie answer to this one that really like, which is that a few, like last year I wrote this essay, uh, about, um, the JFK assassination, uh, and, uh, one of my favorite subjects uh, for Defector. Uh, and in the course of one of the books I was reading to research it, uh, I read about this guy who had been a mob lawyer named um, or mob affiliate named Gerardo Catina. 
And I was like, that's really interesting, Katina, because that's like a, I've heard that name before. And I realized that I'd heard that name before because Ray Katina is the luxurious, is the largest luxury car dealer in the tri-state area. And Gerardo Katina was his uncle. And so there's like a way in which I think that like part of what we, you know, you said about how it's like, well, if somebody doesn't get caught and they made a lot of money, what happens? What happens is they accrue interest. Their kids go to Harvard. You know, they sell more Mercedes. They get a yacht, whatever. They disappear. That's the, you know, like that's that's the privileged purchase with the with, you know, with what Robert they've Maxwell with. got a yacht. <laughs> yes, he did. See what yes, that he did, him. and he got a free trip with it too. <laughs> yeah, and his daughter now sells a software in the UK that's extremely curiously similar to Promise. <laughs> oh wait, not <laughs> Gillen. <laughs> no, the other the one. Other, the yeah. Other. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, yeah. I, if, if if you're a foreign government that's uh, bought the Promise software any time over the last forty years, you just may have been backdoored by the NSA. <laughs> you may have just given up the crown jewels to the U.S. government. Well, uh, Zachary and Christian, I want to thank you for your time, and I want to thank you for your work on the octopus murders. I'm probably going to finish it this afternoon, but it is, as I'll reiterate, a, a, a fascinating and terrifying look into the secret empire and this like nexus of crime and intelligence that is sort of underwrites the history of the latter half of the 20th century. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you guys both so much for taking the time. Such a fun conversation. Thanks so much, Will and Noah. And I'm, I, I'm down to come back anytime. This was really a lot of fun for thank me. Thank you all. No problem. Take it anytime. easy. Take it easy, fellas. Bye.